case of master uh, xyz 5.5 years old male uh, date of birth 12th april 2017 uh, belonging to kanauj informant is father and he is uh, reliable 5.5 years old male uh, master xyz son of mr y resident of kanauj came to our site with the chief complaints of um, fever 1.5 months back for 10 to 15 days headache 1.5 months back for 10 to 15 days abnormal body movement 1 months back two episodes altered sensorium for 1 months not able to speak for 1 months and not able to sit walk and see things for 1 month informant is father and he is reliable history of present illness history was given by father and seems to be reliable according to him the child was apparently asymptomatic one and a half months back when he developed headache lasting for about 10 to 15 days localized to forehead moderate intensity affecting day to day work not associated with vomiting photophobia or any aura at the same time father noticed fever for 10 to 15 days uh 1.5 months back acute in onset undocumented high grade needing sponging it was not associated with rash chills or rigor and it got relieved only momentarily with medications fever and headache was also associated with increasing irritability with each passing day father complains of abnormal body movement one month back after 15 days of headache and fever two episodes the first one involved whole four uh, limbs tightening and loosening in alterations associated with uprolling of eyes associated with bladder incontinence and it lasted for about an hour followed by loss of consciousness for an hour for which he was taken to local hospital and got treated and sent home after 3 to 4 hours of observation the second episode was similar in type but it lasted half an hour followed by loss of consciousness for half an hour it occurred at home uh, and they did not take any treatment for it next day father noticed the child wasn't able to speak at all except screaming some un- incomprehensible sounds child was also not able to sit or walk at all from one month after the abnormal body movement uh, father noticed the child was not able to turn to sides also he was moving his hands and legs properly like cycling and moving hands up and down him uh, without any assistance but wasn't in his sensorium the child couldn't see or talk to his father but was speaking some incomprehensible sound, sounds only and the child is not able to turn towards sounds and respond appropriately when spoken to or asked questions father also gives a history of some snake like moment of both the upper limbs two to three years days later to, sorry days later uh, that subsides during sleep and increases when he gets irritated or cries uh, there is a history of treatment taken outside in form of some iv injections and history of abnormal deviation of eyes uh, since one month uh, both the eyes are deviated towards nose in both side there was associated a uh, loss of weight as per father on asking as his cloth is loosening and also he couldn't tell about the appetite as whenever the father feeds the child is eating properly so on asking leading questions his urinary incontinence is present and the child doesn't cry before urinating but before defecating he does cry uh negative before is- we go to the negative history okay. uh, can i go to the first slide of hopi and i would want to discuss each Uh, symptom and uh, what we can rule in and what we can rule out and want to know the connection between each symptom. Can we go to that uh, uh, the first HOPI wala slide? Uh, yes. Yeah, this should be no, chief complaints. Uh, anyways, we have noted. Huh. Yes. So sir. the first complaint was headache, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, the headache was uh, <clears throat> more in the forehead. It was affecting day to day activities. So uh, the first red flag of headache. which has to be given importance is a child complaining of headache usually children don't complain of headache so that is a red flag yes sir. i mean children as less as 5 years in the second one here is it is affecting day to day activity so these are the two red flags of headache in a child and there is no other red flag which you have mentioned already there is no vomiting what sort of headache increases in the morning uh the headache due to raised icit sir Okay, raised ICT. Uh, 
and the space occupant lesions which yes. in itself cause uh, <clears throat> and what sort of headache also increases in the morning hours before going to the school uh tension uh, no yes tension yeah headache. sort of said tension headaches what sort of headaches increase during the evenings uh during evenings office head oh. the migraine sorts migraine headache the migraine headaches are more towards the end of the day <clears throat> Yes, so, in this child, there is a headache uh, which is associated with fever, and the fever is also uh, of non specific origin. It seems to be of high grade, which is not completely obliterated by medications, and it passes along with the headache. With the just history of fever and headache, what could be the localizing symptom and localizing infection in this child? uh Just because of fever and headache, we can have an intracranial infection. Um, Mm -hmm. Might be because of just meningitis only, or uh, mm -hmm. encep uh, encephalitis, or uh, encephalitis. Uh, will it last for ten to fifteen days? The fever? No, no sir. Mm -hmm. It is acute. So encephalitis usually has some encephalon involvement. Just doesn't yes. have fever and headache as Head a component. Yes. Is it possible that this child has got some illness that is viral and it passes for these many days? Like yes. Suppose dengue infection or chicken gun. Is it possible? Yes, sir. It is possible because so he's having that. So just fever and headache. Is it possible in dengue, or there can there will be other features of dengue also? Uh, there'll be rash. There'll be uh, uh. So looking at the fever and headache, it is possible that it is a viral infection, but it usually doesn't last for two weeks, and there will be other system. Manifestations also. Sometimes in the viral illness, there's cough and coryza and headache, myalgia and vomiting, pain, abdomen, reduce in output. All these features are also there. So it doesn't seem like a simple viral infection of an acute illness. Usually, viral illness are acute, except of course some viruses like HIV, HBS, HBS, and everything. So yes. after this, the fever continued, and then now there is an involvement of encephalon in the form of two episodes of seizures, right? Yes. And following the seizures, father noted the child being hypertensive. Can we move to the next slide? So there was fever, then headache, and then by 10 days of fever, there are two episodes of seizure. And following the seizure, there is severe altered sensory. So this is the progression of the history. So where can you localize the lesion now? So uh, cortical involvement. Yeah, so CNS per se. Okay. Yes. Sir. This is just to rule out whether it is a simple viral infection or some kind of bacterial infection with the prodrome symptoms of fever and headache, or is it really a CNS infection or a CNS pathology causing these problems? So now we are sure that the lesion is in the CNS. And also, child seems to have some abnormal movement like extrapyramidal symptoms also. Yes. Sir. Along with squint. Yes. Sir. And weight loss. So with this history only, I think the diagnosis is made. Even before the diagnosis was made, we had the case discussion only STBI. You can proceed with the uh, presentation next. Negative history. There is no history of fever with rash, no history of cough, cold, and coryza. Uh, there is no history of ear discharge or ear pain. There is no history of head injury. There is no history of bone pain, weight loss, uh, sorry, weight loss is present. Reduced appetite, mm -hmm. prolonged fever with night sweats. Uh, there's no history of prolonged fever with night sweats. There's no history of vaccines, drugs. Uh, there's no history of any chronic diarrhea, fever, chronic cough or oral ulcers. Uh, there is no history of any drug that is uh, immunosuppressive. There's no history of drooping of eyelids or drooling of saliva or any facial asymmetry. And there is no history of deviation of angle of mouth. There is no history. Uh, um, he's able to perceive clothes warm and cold and eats well with father's hand. Can't eat by himself. Cannot rule out history of numbness or tingling sensation. There is no history of excessive sweating, palpitation or flushing. There is no history of hematuria, facial puffiness, reduced urine output. There is no history of sudden onset of breathlessness, refusal to feed or swelling of the lower limbs with bluish discoloration of skin. There is no history of pallor, abdominal distension, painful fingers, sudden onset of pain, abdomen or recurrent leg ulcers. Uh, 
and there is no history of loose tools, vomiting, reduced activity, and reduced uh, urine output. Okay, with so much of negative history, what all things did you actually rule out? Uh, I ruled out, sir, the cause of uh, this uh, meningoencephalitis that we are suspecting. Uh, mm -hmm. I ruled out viral encephalitis first, mm -hmm. and uh, then I ruled out uh, acute bacterial meningitis, though the progression is, well, it is taking uh, quite time uh, for the patient to deteriorate. But uh, then I am ruling out, sir, uh, HIV uh, mm -hmm. and other causes of. Uh, uh, that are, you ask the drooping of eyelids, drooping of saliva, facial and asymmetry, or deviation. To rule out cranial lobes involvement, yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. To rule there is no focal deficit only in any of the history that you presented. No, there is no focal deficit as such. Why did you suddenly go for cranial nerve deficit yes, or sir. a stroke like manifestation? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Uh, basal ganglia involvement in form of choreoarthroid moment is present, except that no focal neurological deficit. Okay. Yes. Then what is the next slide? Treatment history, sir. Uh, father was told that the child has some brain fever and needs IV injection when they went to um, uh, treatment for first episode of abnormal body movement. Uh, since the day of abnormal body movement, they were getting the injections two times a day for seven days. And thereafter, they uh, took some oral medications. We don't have any documentation for that. Uh, but after 20 to 25 days, uh, they felt not much relief, though the fever and headache and irritability were subsided, but the child still was not in his senses and wasn't able to sit by himself. Uh, they went to some other hospital where uh, they took oral medications at home basis only and was given um, uh, and, and no investigation was done. After one and a half months now, they came to our site when they were referred from that hospital. In our hospital, some blood investigations and some fluid was taken from the back. Chest x-ray, MRI brain was done due to financial constraints. The investigations took time and no injections were given till now. At present, no fever, no headache is present. Child is in, is in his altered sensorium. He's screaming incomprehensible sounds. He's not able to sit, not able to turn to sides or even look at parents. He's unable to recognize his father and has involuntary moments in upper limbs but is able to kick with force when pinched or someone sits on the leg. And after uh, the reports came, some oral tablets, empty stomach have been started. Okay. Past history is not significant, sir. Uh, family mm -hmm. history. He is a second order born product of non-consanguous marriage. Uh, there is a similar history, uh, no similar history in family present, but history of uh, pulmonary TB is present in mother it, uh, eight years back, uh, for which she was treated for six months. And uh, in father, uh, four years back, he was also treated adequately as per father. Antenatal history, pregnancy was confirmed by pre urine pregnancy test, booked case, no history of fever with rash, painful swelling behind ears, exposure to pets during pregnancy, no history of high blood pressure, sugar reading, thyroid disorder, no history of bleeding, per leaking per vaginum, sir. no history of uh, radiation exposure, antenatal scans were normal and um, she, uh, she was said to be taken tetanus vaccine, iron, folic acid and calcium supplement. Mm -hmm. Natal history is contributory if it's there. No, okay. sir. Go on, go on, go on. Uh, natal history was uneventful. He was born at term uh, via LSCS and um, uh, baby was said to be cried immediately. There was no history of abnormal body movement, no history of fever discharge from the umbilical cord and delayed separation of or any uh, event during birth. He was uh, discharged on day four of life and direct breastfeeding but continued. Immunization history, okay. uh, it is incomplete. Uh, they only took uh, immunization at birth and now two months back on February, he got uh, DPD vaccine in anterolateral aspect of thigh. Development history, he is uh, developmentally normal, sir. Uh, okay. Dietary history, pre-illness dietary intake um, observed is 1,270 against the expected of 1,400 at this age and uh, deficit is 130 kilocalorie. Uh, protein is uh, 23 uh, grams per DL against the expected of 24 grams per DL. So deficit is 1 gram per DL. During illness, the calorie intake is 1100 
uh, against the expected of 1400. So deficit is, deficit is 300 kilocalorie and proteins um, observed is uh, 20 grams per deal expected uh, is 24. So deficit is four gram. Socioeconomic status, they belong to lower middle class according to quantified BG Prasad scale. So. Summary, five and a half year old male of birth order two, born of non-consanguous marriage, came to our site three days back with complaints of fever for 10 to 15 days, one and a half months back, headache for 10 to 15 days, one and a half months back, abnormal body movement, one month back, unable to speak, walk, sit and see for one month and altered sensorium for one month with trunkal weakness, without loss of power of the limbs, with involuntary abnormal body movement, with uneven full antenatal and natal history, with novel developmental milestones attained as per age, incompletely immunized, belonging to lower middle class as per modified BG Prasad scale. Uh, general examination, okay. sir. Uh, could you stop at uh, the probable diagnosis that you've written? Yes, sir. Uh, as per history, sir, it's a chronic intracranial infection presenting with stroke, uh, with global aphasia, with extra pyramidal system involvement, without cranial nerve involvement. With cranial nerve involvement, it should have been there, sir. Okay, comment. Uh, uh, I'll just uh, switch over to how do each sorts of presentations present. Uh, let us assume the child has an acute bacterial meningitis. What would be the natural course of uh, presentation? So it would have been an acute uh, presentation with uh, fever, um, fever, headache, and uh, vomiting plus minus sir, increased irritability mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, focal neurological deficit at the, the minus seizures. At the, uh, yes, sir. Plus plus minus seizures. Mm -hmm. But focal mm -hmm. neurological deficit at the presentation is uh, quite rare in acute bacterial meningitis. Sir. Okay, so the course of illness would be an acute onset fever of about two to three days with irritability and then presenting a severe encephalopathy with or without seizures. Yes, sometimes less likely to have a focal deficit. Yes, sir. Okay, so that would be an acute bacterial meningitis presentation. What would be the presentation of an acute demyelinating event? Let us assume ADEM. Acute demyelinating won't... Uh... It will be encephalopathy will be predominant, sir. Along with that, there will be yes. multifocal uh, involvement of, uh, and along with that, uh, spinal cord may be also be involved. So, meaning uh, there is fever usually may be present, may not be present, and not be present. Yes. Along with there is a significant history of focal deficit with or without seizure and okay. multifocal symptoms that yes. last for about a few weeks few weeks and then will it progress or will it plateau over a period of time yes sir history of vaccination and history of recent vaccination or viral prodrome uh some days back might be present might be not present okay uh, <clears throat> what i was asking was what will be the progression of a disease in a demyelinating event meaning it starts off as an acute or a subacute event and then it plateaus over the next few weeks and mildly improves it may not touch the normal baseline but in a demyelinating event, there is worsening and then it plateaus. Whereas in acute, there is severe worsening and then plateaus with treatment. Whereas in the chronic condition, like this child, started off as a subacute problem, then continues to progress and even worsening over a period of time in spite of treatment. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, can you consider of a chronic bacterial meningitis or acute bacterial meningitis that was improperly treated at this phase? Uh Yes, sir. Can you? Okay, so yeah, it, it can be possible. And why did you mention stroke in your diagnosis? Where is the evidence of stroke? There are no focal deficits as such. The child is in encephalopathy and lie down and is not speaking. But however, you yourself mentioned the child is able to move in cycles and is able to lift above the bed. Yes. So involuntary movements. In stroke is usually negative symptoms, no? Absence of movements or positive of movements, rather. Mm. Yes, so, sir. does this child have stroke somewhere? Um, we'll find it in the examination. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, go ahead. We'll, we'll see. General examination. Uh, patient XYZ is lying comfortably on father's lap with some choreoathroid movement of upper limb with eyes deviated inwards, altered sensorium, and not oriented to time, place, and person. Vitals. Temperature, he's afebrile. 
uh, pulse rate 110 beats per minute, regular in volume, no radio radial, radio femoral delay. All peripheral pulses are felt well. Respiratory rate 28 uh, per minute, abdominal thoracic. Blood pressure is 90 uh, by 60 millimeters of mercury in right upper limb in supine position. That is uh, that lies between 50th to 90th centile for age, sex, and height. Uh, uh, saturation is 98% in room air. Anthropometry. And the GRBs was normal. Sugars yes. were normal. Yes, sir. Sugar oh. was normal. Yes. yes. Anthropometry. Uh, he's a 5.5 year male. Uh, weight for age observed is 11 kg. Expected is 19.3. So he uh, against the uh, it lies between fifth and tenth centile as per IAP growth chart. Height for age is um, uh, between 50th to 90th centile as per IAP growth chart. And BMI is uh, fifth to 90th tenth centile as per IAP growth chart. So he uh, is a thin built patient. Based on his dietary history, he seemed to have sufficient uh, intake. You know, so how do we explain his uh, thinning? Uh, or is it constituent in the family? So maybe because uh, of the chronic illness. Chronic illness, height should come down or weight should come down? So height should come down, sir. So it's a recent onset wasting. Yes. So that is why he's yes. thinned out. This is after one and a half months, of course, no? Of the illness. Yes. Okay, yes. go on. Head to toe examination, no pallor, ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or edema. Head is normal in shape, size. Uh, here, you can mention no. what is uh, <clears throat> positive in this child and the rest of the Yes, sir. Eyes, uh, squint is present that suggests uh, bilateral uh, cranial nerve 6 palsy, otherwise, uh, spine, genital, and normal. CNS examination, higher mental functions. He's altered, uh, not oriented to time, place, and person, and memory, speech, handedness cannot be assessed. Cranial nerve examination. He's not oriented to person also? If he sits on his father's lap, uh, he seems to be comfortable no? based on your uh, initial points of examination. Yes, sir. But he is not identifying his father and he is not identifying anybody. Not by vision, by touch and by feel, uh, by voice. If mother comes around or father comes around, does he uh, become aware and calm down or he still remains in the same agitated state? Uh, Yes, sir. He calms down uh, only okay, when so the father comes. Then there is some orientation to person. So orientation is not just by vision. So there's some orientation to the person because he eats only when he when the father feeds him. No. Yes, sir. Okay. Fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. No problem. Mean, uh, first is normal. Second, visual activity couldn't be done. Perception of light is present, but he doesn't blink when the hand is moved past his eyes. So uh, I'm suspecting cortical blindness also. Uh, bilateral color vision, field of vision, accommodation, it couldn't be done. Light reflex is normal, uh, both direct and consensual. Sir. And fundus, uh, peripapillary atrophy, rest is normal. Third, okay. sixth. Uh, third, fourth, sixth is um, sixth bilateral uh, cranial nerve six involvement, and uh, fifth is normal. So, uh, seventh is also normal. Taste sensation and uh, taste sensation couldn't be checked. Then, uh, nine, tenth, eleven, twelfth is also normal. So, okay. <clears throat> motor system bulk uh, is normal, no hypertrophy or atrophy. Power couldn't be mm -hmm. assessed. It is just assessed by looking at the maximum activity done by child. So in this power and then tone. Yes, sir. Power. And tone assessment comes first. Okay. Yes. Sir. Can you go on to tone first and then power? Can you yes, describe sir. tone? And yes, then sir. Tone? yes, 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 sir. Hmm. Tone, um, tone is normal in uh, right and left upper arm, uh, but in upper uh, um, limbs, but in lower limbs, hip, knee, and ankle, in both the side, it is increased, sir. Okay. Any asymmetry in the increase of the tone, right more no. than left, left more than right? No, no, no asymmetry, sir. So it's only in the lower limbs and not in the upper limbs? Not in the upper limbs, sir. So is there a possibility of stroke when there is no... Uh, involvement of upper limb and lower limb on both sides, only the lower limbs. Is it possible like that? Uh, you want to localize? Yes, sir. The increase in tone mentions what? What is the inference of tone increase? Where is the pathology? 
upper uh, motor neuron pathology, sir. Uh, white matter. Yes, central nervous system, sir. Yes. So where do you see tone increase only in the lower limbs? Diplegic sorts? Uh, is it possible in any stroke? Yes. MCA stroke, uh, lower limbs is more involved, sir. But what about upper limb? There will be some involvement or no? Uh, involvement lesser. More in... Number. Will it be normal completely? Yes, sir. No, tone cannot be normal in case of a stroke, yes. at least after the almost mm -hmm. one, one and a half months. And upper limb involvement will be usually more. And there is some asymmetry. If there is a stroke on one side, there should be normal on the other side and increased on this side. Or it is in the acute stage, it can be low on the affected side also. So tone is increased only in the lower limb, you say. Probably you can re-examine on both sides and check for the asymmetry. You can go on with our examination. Yes, sir. Power, um, right and left side and shoulder um, because the child was able to lift his hand upwards and I, uh, mm. so at least four by five and uh, elbow wrist and uh, MCP joint uh, because he was uh, forcefully uh, pushing against some objects so at least four by five and wrist and MCP by the grip uh, we could check and then uh, lower limb sir Hip. He was obeying to hold the grip. I mean, he was obeying to hold the pen or torch or whatever. No, he was obeying. not obeying. No, he was not obeying, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Momentarily, while he was doing the things, we observed, mm -hmm. sir. So, was it a voluntary grasp or was it an involuntary grasp that was present? Uh, he was. So, what is the difference between voluntary grasp and involuntary grasp? Uh, the involuntary grasp uh, lasts for. Long. Which is stronger, the involuntary or the voluntary? Involuntary. And what can happen when you ask the child, there's a baby, a newborn, like three months, one month, one and a half months. Whatever yes. you keep in the hand, the child is going to hold it. That is an involuntary grasp. Yes. And you cannot ask the baby to release. It doesn't know what yes. is a release reflex. Yes. So yes. this child with a CNS lesion, with such a strong grip, is yes. it voluntary or involuntary? I'm not sure. I'm not examine the baby. So I want to know whether uh, there was an involuntary. Was he able to release it when he asked to release? No, sir. He was not obeying commands. So, so likely to be involuntary. It was a strong, yes, sir. So what are the differentiating features between voluntary and involuntary? Voluntary is the child will develop that reflex a little later in life by about six weeks to eight weeks. Yes. Sir. And the child learns to release the objects. Yes. And the grip strength is not as huge as involuntary. Whereas in involuntary, it is there since birth. The grip strength is very strong. It is not momentary. It can last for minutes also. <clears throat> and child will not be able to release on demand. Yes, sir. In case of a CNS insult, they go back to their... There is a regression. So they go back to their primitive reflexes. And that is why we see a very good grip strength. Maybe that is the reason why this child has got a very good hand grip strength. Okay. Yes. We can now go on with the next one. Uh, lower limbs, uh, hip, flexion, extension, abduction, uh, at least four by five, uh, both the side and knee also at least four by five, both the side. Uh, deep tendon reflexes. Yeah, biceps, and, biceps and triceps were two, two plus uh, right and left side. Supinator, I could assess it was three plus and knee uh, was three plus. Ankle, uh, clonus was present, so four oh. plus. Superficial reflexes, corneal, abdominal, bulbocavernosus were present, bilateral, and plantar was extensor bilateral. So sensory cerebellar signs couldn't be assessed. At mm -hmm. least there was no uh, visible nystagmus. Um, okay. And, and then uh, extrapyramidal moments were present, choreothroid moment present in bilateral upper limb that subsides while the patient was sleeping. Uh, involving whole hands starting from distal reach is too proximal. Meningeal signs were absent, sir, and spine was normal. All other systems were within normal limit. Can you go to your cranial nerves once? Yes, sir. Nerve and, uh, yes, sir. So the perception was light was present and the child is not able to perceive the finger or the hand you mentioned. Yes, sir. So how do you differentiate between cortical blindness and optic atrophy? Uh, so optic atrophy, there won't be uh, light, uh, direct uh, 
uh, light reflex present, sir. And in cortical mm -hmm. blindness, the reflexes uh, won't be affected, but the child couldn't perceive. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> what about uh, hand perceptions and the visual acuity? Which is not we are not able to check which is more affected. Uh, which yes. gets affected first? You don't get the question, is it? Yes, visual. Uh... Okay, in cortical blindness, the visual acuity can. This child is non-cooperative. In a cooperative child, in a cortical blind child, you will not be able to assess visual acuity whatsoever. Yes. Whereas in a child with optic atrophy, some amount of visual acuity will still be left. Yes. Sir. Okay, whatever is there beneath the optic nerve has a problem. So the optic nerve doesn't have a problem. So direct and indirect will both be present. Yes. And uh, visual acuity can be tested a bit in optic atrophy in the early stages, not in the full blown optic atrophy. Yes. Sir. Okay, in cortical blindness, there can be nystagmus also, which is less likely in optic atrophy. Yes. Okay. Which one was possible in this child? Cortical or based on the pathology? Yes. Cortical sir. blindness is more believable or optic atrophy is more believable? Optic atrophy, sir. Okay. It's more believable, sir. Why so? Uh, because uh, secondary optic atrophy is present in a uh, chronic. Uh, uh, if we are suspecting chronic a patient as TB. Uh, TBM. Any chronic meningitis of raised ICP you know, is an artosensorium for so yes. long, likely yes. to be raised ICP also. Yes. Okay, go on. <clears throat> what were your uh, final slides? Summary, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah, go five, on. and, five and a half year old male uh, of birth order two, born to consanguous marriage, came to our site three days back with complaints of fever for 10 to 15 days, one and a half months back, headache for 10 to 15 days, one and a half months back, abnormal body movement one month back, unable to speak, walk, sit and see for one month and altered sensorium for one month with trunkal weakness without loss of power of limbs with involuntary abnormal body movement with um, uneven antenatal, natal and uh, normal developmental milestones. Uh, thin built, incompletely immunized, belonging to lower middle class as per modified BG Prasad scale, sir. On examination, he is altered. Uh, is he is in altered mental state, screaming incomprehensible sounds, but cooperating while eating with father's hand. Thin built as per anthropometry, with stable vitals. In CNS examination, bilateral uh, lateral rectus palsy is present with increased tone in bilateral lower limbs with brisk uh, deep in and reflexes in lower limbs with ankle clonus with choreoestroid movement present in bilateral upper limb with uh, bilateral sixth cranial nerve involvement with cortical blindness. So can you club all of this and put it into a diagnosis? No? Yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Five and a half year old male with chronic meningoencephalitis with bilateral cranial nerve sixth palsy with cortical blindness without hemiparesis with choreoestroitis movement with most uh, most likely due to basal ganglia infarct with raised ICT uh, with thin built with incomplete immunization and positive family history of pulmonary TB. Probable etiology is TBM uh, stage two because uh, couldn't... Um, he was not comatose and I cannot uh, be, sir, uh, imaging has not been uh, told. No problem. Even so, stage 2 with MCA infarct, um, with posterior circuit. TB meningitis so, state, stages is based on clinical history or it's based yes, on imaging? Yes, clinical, sir. Most likely clinical. Okay. Sir. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Uh, MCA infarct and posterior circulation infarct producing cortical blindness and basal ganglia inv involvement, sir. Okay. So, uh, Putting it into a diagnosis, uh, before we go on to etiological diagnosis, it is a chronic history or subacute chronic history, which is progressive and not static. Yes. Sir. So subacute onset, chronic disease of progressive variety with blindness, altered sensorium, bilateral cranial nerve, symmetric cranial nerve involvement without weakness. What are the features of MCA infarct that you mentioned? Is it possible to not have any limb weakness, but only have uh, less like symptoms? So it is less likely. So probably the terminal branches, thalamoperforating branches, okay, you can consider. Yes, what are the major features of posterior circulation stroke? Uh, the most important? So posterior circulation, uh, involuntary moments, uh, vision, okay. and uh, the thalamic... Major ICP is more an anterior circulation stroke or posterior circulation stroke? Yes, sir. Raised ICP is more in posterior circulation stroke or anterior circulation stroke? Uh, Raised ICT. Yeah. In posterior circulation stroke, 
they can be more raised icd which causes severe headache and vomiting and vomiting doesn't seem to be a symptom at all in, in any of the symptoms that you have mentioned yes sir okay so it is less believable that there is an mca infarct consideration of an mca infarct uh, without any uh, limb weakness but before that uh, based on the chronology of events there is a chronic disease of subacute onset initially and then goes on to become chronic and progressive yes uh, with involvement of one two cranial nerves no, symmetric cranial nerves bilaterally and involuntary movements with altered sensory Yes, the positive family history that seems to be insignificant because the latest one is only four years around. Yes, so at this point, what are the differentials apart from TB meningitis that you can think of? Uh, so partially treated bacterial meningitis. Perfect. Infectious causes. Um, okay. Like uh, fungal meningitis. Infectious okay, causes. Yes. Chronic sir. meningitis. Okay. Chronic meningitis. Uh, thereafter, so. Uh, Complication uh, of bacterial abscess. meningitis in the form of abscess. Abscess, yes, sir. brain abscess. Okay, okay. empyema, brain abscess. Brain what would abscess. be the presentation in case of abscess or empyema? Would there be recession of fever, or it would continue to have fever in spite of antibiotics? Uh, it'll be uh, in in brain it's, abscess, sir. Brain abscess, empyema, or a fungal ball, or a fungal abscess. They'll be decreasing fever. The now, what are the features of abscess? There will be fever or absence of fever? Low grade fever, so yeah, continuous low grade fever. What else? There's a pressure effect, so there would be a lot of seizure also and this vomiting also. Does. Yes. Yeah, this child doesn't seem to have much seizures after that. Yes, sir. And there would be a definite focal deficit if there is an expansile mass that is occupying the space, either vomiting or it will be a focal deficit, focal which deficit. the child doesn't seem to have. Yes, sir. So, it is completely not safe to exclude abscess for now. It is still possible to have a space occupying lesion of infective origin, be it tuberculoma or an abscess or an empyema. Yes, sir. So, Just the basal ganglia, both the side involved, it is unlikely for that. Unlikely for? Uh, basal ganglia of both the side, will that be involved, sir? Yeah, it, is, it is possible in meningitis, no? vasculitis meningitis can yes. cause infarcts, but it won't be symmetric like this. This yes. child seems to have a symmetric involvement. Yes, sir. Symmetric involvement is usually some autoimmune process or an encephalopathic process. Yes, sir. So, okay. Can the first thing is infective. Uh, the first consideration is TB meningitis, which seems to be a fair consideration based on the history and also an examination. The second one is partially treated patient meningitis, which has gone into a chronic meningitis barventriculitis complex. Yes, sir. Uh, the second one is probability of fungal, but there are no other stigmata related to fungal or having the immune suppression before. Yes, what sir. other things can you think of? Can it be a simple space occupying lesion in the form of a malignancy? Brain tumor, yes, sir. Possible, but there is no yes, focal sir. deficit at all. There's no continuous vomiting, there's no seizure. Yes, sir. It could be autoimmune encephalitis also, so uh, involuntary movement and abnormal behavior. Okay, involuntary movements are only restricted to limbs. Uh, what happens in autoimmune encephalitis? Yes, sir. It is ab um, it happens. Uh, abnormal behavior also is present. Yes. yes like lip smacking, uh, automatism is present. So, orofacial dyskinesias. Yes, sir. Seizures, focal deficits can, may or may not be there. Mm -hmm. What is the course of an autoimmune encephalitis if left untreated? They usually plateau over a period of time and don't progress into a such semi comatose or almost comatose state. Yes, sir. They start off having with an acute presentation or subacute presentation. Following that, they'll go into severe encephalopathy and then they recover back to a plateau. They may not become completely normal. They yes. persist to have all those involuntary movements. It is a good, good consideration to have autoimmune encephalitis. Yes. You can also consider some of the space occupying lesions of the brain. The midbrain lesions usually don't produce so much of seizures or vomiting or raised eyes. The posterior ones do. Yes. And another consideration is a chronic demyelinating illness, which has been not treated. Let us say NMO or emoji. So these should be the considerations. Yes. Okay, NMO or emoji. Emoji is yes. less likely. NMO is a possibility. But the age and the gender does not go well with the presentation. Okay, yes. go on. Um, investigation, sir. CSF after ruling out papilledema. Um, mm -hmm. uh, CSF report as he has uh, took some antibiotics. Uh, so mm -hmm. cell counts were not raised. And even protein mm -hmm. and glucose was normal, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this, I think, most of us know. Yes. 
Oh, these are the images, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Okay, what does this show? Can you just... Uh... Yes, sir. Okay. What does it show? Can you read the MRI or... Uh, I'd be happy to read it, but if it is possible, please tell it me. It was MRI, sir. MRI, yes. That's what I'm saying. Can you, imaging. Can, uh, can you go to the next slide? Yes, sir. Uh, can you... Uh, can you recognize the sequence? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. It is. Okay, fine. Uh, this is an axial flare huh? showing diffuse uh, cerebral atrophy along with uh, dilatation of the ventricles with periventricular ooze. It seems to be in in pressure. There's a periventricular hyperintensity in changes and a lot of hyperintensity inside the ventricle also, the choroid plexus. Mm -hmm. So this is indicative of hydrocephalus communicating thoughts only with Ooze, which means it is under the pressure. Do uh, you have anything more left? Is the child on some treatment? How do you treat? How do you approach uh, <clears throat> the diagnostics in this child? You've done funders, it shows optic atrophy. You've done CSF. Yes. Uh, we expected the child to be having TBM, but then since the child has received antibiotics, it also looks like a picture of partially treated progenic meningitis to me right now. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, what are the drugs that are used in common practice that can cause the problem of uh, some remission of TB meningitis? In the day-to-day -day practice, we use it a lot. What what antibiotic do we use that also has anti-tubercular property? We use it most common in the OPDs. Amica sir. Uh, uh, sorry, ceftriaxone. Oh. Okay. What is used before usually septroxone? What do we use? Amoxiclav? Amoxiclav, yes. Sir. Okay, so that is the major culprit in most of the TB meningitis uh, that come to us after a treatment elsewhere. So it was a good presentation and we've collected good details of the history. Only one thing that I wanted to ask you was uh, there should be some elaboration how the child is feeding. Since he's in so, like, such a bad encephalopathy, uh, it takes a little bit extra effort to ask about the feeding in the form that does he take his usual hours of uh, duration of feeding or does he extend it to hours of feeding? How is his swallowing? How is his opening of mouth? How is his chewing? So this also needs to be included in the history. Yes, sir. Uh, this history, it was quite clear that there was a focal lesion in the CNS only and then the progression also was indicative of a chronic infective process. So almost a clear-cut case since it was almost diagnostic of TBM. Uh, I would like to add a few points of what can be asked in the examinations and uh, take you through uh, even meningitis and also stroke or stroke like events since we discussed that it could be possibility of stroke. Uh, is there anything that you want to add or can I go ahead and uh, share my slides? No, sir. Awesome. You want to show about management? Uh, um... We'll do supportive management, sir, A, B, C, and then we'll manage raised ICT, seizure, and coma. And definitive treatment, we'll start ATT with steroids. Okay, what and, is the management of raised ICT? How do you do it? Uh, so, head and elevation, uh, mm -hmm. 30 degree, and um, oxygenation, right. sir, uh, isotonic fluid, uh, and sir, uh, mannitol or 3% NS, if available. And if the patient is taking orally, we can give astazolamide or furosemide, sir. Okay. Uh, why is if, it uh, head in the midline elevation by 30 to 45 degrees? What is the reason behind that? Uh, sir, because uh, uh, perfusion uh, is... In... The venous drainage is maximum at 30 to 45 degrees, even at the raised altitude pressures. Yes. And it needs to be in the midline to not have compressive effect. Hmm. Normothermia, normoglycemia, normotonia, Head and the midline. Yes, sir. Prevention of uh, fever and seizures is important to manage races. ICP. What drugs do you mention, Manitol? How much do you give? Manitol is available in what percentage in India? 20%, sir. Yes. And how do you give? Yes, sir. What is the dosage? Uh, 5 ml per kg, sir. Loading and then? And then 2 ml per kg uh, in QID, sir. How do you stop? Uh, 3 to 5 days, sir. Do you want to taper and stop by frequency or by dosage? Uh, I don't know, sir. Okay, you need to stop by here. 
Losing the frequency initially, you're giving three times, and you should make it daily, and then daily, and then stop it. What precautions do you take before giving mannitol? Uh, electrolyte management and shock. He should not be in shock, sir. And renal parameters. Renal involvement. Yes. Sir. Okay. What inotrope in case of a child with raised ICP with shock? What inotrope do you prefer? Is a child in shock? And yes, also has raised ICP. Uh, what would be the first? Norad, Norad, sir, to increase Norid, the Norid. blood pressure. To increase the blood pressure or increases the cerebral perfusion pressure, also the renal perfusion. Yes, sir. Fine. Right. <clears throat> uh, ATT, I'll tell you briefly. Okay, I'll go ahead and share the screen. Aksha, is it okay? This is just yes. only for the exam purpose. Yes, sir. Okay. So I think most of you already know by this stage. Uh, this is only for how things are asked in the examination. Uh, most of us are asked these questions. Are my slides visible? Yes, sir. OK. Uh, I'll not take more than 10 minutes for this. Uh, TBM, I think this is a basic class for all of us. Uh, it's an intracellular, more than extracellular organism, which is obligate aerobe. And the major features why it affects humans, and mostly in the pediatric age group, is Either the children are immune naive, meaning there is immune competency happening till about eight to nine years of age, and that is the maximum period where TB meningitis is seen between one to nine years. And another reason why CNS is susceptible is because of the poor reticular endothelial system, which lacks lots of macrophages, which is present in other systems. And the type of presentation of TBM is subacute, chronic, acute, and asymptomatic also, not TB meningitis, but TB. And environmental, as we all know, it is either on nutrition, along with combination of crowding and depends on the health seeking behavior of the family also. And recently, there is a gene, NRAMP1 gene, which makes it susceptible. So there's a lot of uh, difficulty, this I face difficulty during my PG days to correlate what happens when. And uh, if we can, this is one thing that is asked in the Vibo also. The microbiological stage almost reflects on the clinical stage also. Initially, the inhaled bacilli through the pulmonary alveolar macrophages gets into the bloodstream and also has a primary focus in the lung as well as in the CNS, that is in the subaffinal space, which is called as a rich focus. The activation of this depends on the immune status of the child, and sometimes trauma also can activate this uh, seed of uh, subependymal primary module that is called the rich focus. So, if that gets activated, there is a prodrome in the form of non neurological symptoms, usually, or mild neurological symptoms. The fever, headache, and loss of appetite with some weight loss and uh, almost no neurological symptoms as this child had. It was about two weeks. And then the second stage microbiological is proliferation of the bacilli in the rich focus. And then it get, gets seeded into the meningeal layer, which causes exudates and vasculitis also, which is the most likely reason this child has got obesity and yeah, infarct, which is called a vascular inflammation and then fibrinoid changes also in the vessel causing stroke of the very small vessels, which is possibility in this child. And the second stage where the bacilli rupture from the subrepentinal focus into the meningeal focus causes meningeal irritation signs, seizures, altered sensorium, and now the deficits start. Most of the exudates, they seep down and get into the subarachnoid space because that is where the subrepentinal space communicates to. And there is a lot of stasis in the subarachnoid space causing Brainstem compression. So that causes cranial neuropathies and also direct vascular invasion is possible through these exhibits. And the third stage is immune response and progressive caseation and further causes obstruction hydrocephalus. The same thing happens in stage three, where there is diffuse or focal cerebral involvement causing refractive seizure, stupor, posturing, and coma. And if left untreated, these children usually die by four to eight weeks. So if you can see, uh, Uh, this is the subarachnoid space, which is maximal around the base occiput. So any lesion here or any exudate here presses on the brain stem, and that is the reason why there is obstruction to the CSF flow as well as chor choroid chorionic villi. So sorry, the compression of the which is uh, you can see here there is a basal exudate 
which is causing enhancement around the base occiput and the base of the brain so how can we identify this there are many clinical scores major ones that are asked in the exam is ahuja criteria which are two mandatory features and any of these two but these were taken from an adult study of only 70 patients and the sensitivity specifically was quite poor so they went on to do another study which has five features this is only in pediatric population and if any of these three were present the specificity increased up to 98% if any one was present the sensitivity is 98% this can be used along with this in the clinical setup if there is a hyponatremia also that is also a pointer towards tb management this this is taken from ntps2 diagnostic algorithm and went to start so this is the recent ntp program uh, Uh, regimen there are no cat one cat two regimens anymore for all of these two hrs ad and four hra the only exception is continuation phase becomes 10 months in case of cns tb that includes spinal tb also this is the dosages i think most of you know the dosages it is important to know that steroids need to be given for about 6 to 8 weeks preferably over 8 weeks uh, steroid of choice is usually dexamethasone but prednisolone can also be given at 2 mg per kg for initial 4 weeks and then taper over the next 4 weeks So one of the complications are expected in TB meningitis is hydrocephalus, which this child has, to be managed by reservoir of the proteins are high. The proteins are normal. We patient can be inserted. Capital toxicity. We can break the regimen for a week and uh, restart. And one favorite question in YY is IRS immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. Uh, it is usually when a child has TBM, the immunity is low. We start treating the TB, the immunity improves, and then there is immune reconstitution causing hyperinflammation, which needs to be man managed by steroids. Which is tailored to each child, and overall prognosis: the mortality is about 20 to 30, 39 percent. Stage one recover 100 percent with minor deficits with some learning disability. Stage two 75 percent of them recover, but moderate disability is expected. Whereas stage three the mortality is as high as 70 percent. The surviving stage three has uh, severe neurological deficit. So in this child, uh, this is the course of this child it has persistently worsened over a period of time, and he has landed up in almost semi coma or stupor. But as in other chronic illnesses like demyelinating or autoimmune disorders, they also follow a similar curve as a chronic CNS infection like meningitis, ventricular ventricular or abscess or TB meningitis. But after a certain period, that is four to five weeks of duration, they plateau, but they never come to the normal baseline. They will persist to have some deficit, but they will not have a chronic progressive course. This is the major uh, history that we need to take to differentiate between an infective ongoing process. And an inflammatory process that has stuck at this point and caused the damage. And uh, since we were discussing on the stroke, can I go ahead? My audible. Ah uh, yes, sir. Your audible, sir. Yeah, another. Two slides. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. No problem. Sure. So, since we discussed about the stroke in this child, uh, uh, but there seems to be no focal deficit as such, uh, it needs to be re-examined again. Since we are considering the stroke, and on the MRI, there is diffuse uh, cortical atrophy. There is no manifestation of a stroke that I could make out. Uh, this is a basic of stroke, which part of the brain is supplied by which artery or which vessel. So. Here I have made it cold, meaning there is ischemia. So since the vessel is not supplying, this is the vascular territory of the brain being supplied. Meaning these are the parts of the brain that stop working and can have features. So this is only basal ganglia here. So if these vessels get affected, it is not only the isolated basal ganglia that will have manifestation. There can be aphasia, hemianopia, contralateral hemiparesis, and neglect also if it is in the non-dominant side. So this is a basic of stroke where the vessel, if it gets affected. The whole vascular territory supplied by that vessel gets affected. This is the major principal understanding behind the stroke. So, if we understand the stroke, we can differentiate between stroke-like episodes. You see, this stroke the vascular territory is affected, hence the deficit will be specific to that vascular territory, which is rare in a stroke. Stroke episode is muscular, but there is some weakness of the vascular origin. And the onset is usually paroxysmal. That is sudden onset. In TIA, there is offset, but whereas in stroke, severe weakness at the onset only. 
there has been stroke like episode and the onset is more gradual it starts about one to two days and then sometimes goes on to weeks also and neurological features are usually negative in the form of aphasia like this child has visual loss but paresis was not there in this child whereas in a child with stroke like episode the extra pyramidal features are high the consciousness impairment is less in in stroke whereas in stroke like episode the consciousness is more altered it is more of encephalopathy and if you do a neuro image there's a pathology which is more specific to vascular territory where it is normal in stroke like episode so major mimics of stroke that is asked in the exam is migraine the next that we need to take is headache with some precipitation that is photophobia or phonophobia more in the evening more while traveling or after missing the diet and the weakness is episode if it will be there for today and then child will recover within hours and it is not persistent and there is usually a family history of migraine and normal neuro imaging except in acute migraine attacks in cns infection unlike stroke there is history of fever and subacute onset of deficit whereas in stroke there is acute onset severe weakness and meningeal signs are usually positive in cns infection and neuro imaging is not very classical vascular territory i'll be showing an example to differentiate demyelination there is subacute onset weakness gradual to slow progression not highest at the onset the symptoms will be polyfocal meaning there is some spinal cord symptom there is some vision symptom and there is also limb symptom thought paralysis it happens seizure first and then the focal weakness that recovers well over a period of time in metabolic conditions that cause stroke like mitochondrial disorders and organic acidemia there is concurrent failure to thrive delayed milestones or regression of milestones and some metabolic crisis during a fever and they worsen during that phase and there is multi system disease this will be my last stage uh, slide this is a stroke of left mcu you can see the whole of the arterial supply on the left hemisphere is gone this is the demyelinating disorder edm there is focal multifocal enhancing lesions which are not confined to the vascular territory so this is uh, a vascular territory because of left mcu infarct this is polyfocal symptoms because of a demyelination and has got nothing to do with the vessel so there is no stroke like symptom or any radiological picture here and here you can see only on the one side the sylvian region that is a temporal region the sylvian region is hyper intense this is an infective origin if it was stroke there would be involvement of the adjacent basal ganglia as well as the gray matter and the white matter beneath and this is only a focal hyper intensity which is seen in hsv encephalitis so these are the usual clinical pictures as well as mri pictures of stroke versus stroke type episodes so that ends uh, the session is a little bit of the episode uh neercha do you have any doubts please feel free to ask to sir so uh, how can we define the basal ganglia involvement in this okay. if it is not stroke so okay uh we we'll have to pull up the same uh, slide and um, spin it up so the microvasculature the thalamo perforating branches that you can see here yes, the sir. terminal branches of the m1 and m2 segments can have inflammatories causing basal ganglia stroke but bilateral involvement is less likely there could be an ongoing vasculitis or an ongoing inflammatory change that can cause extra pyramidal symptoms that is a, a explanation for basal ganglia and since the basal ganglia structure is very close to the subcutaneous space of the basal occiput and at the base uh, it is more likely that the proximal vessels that you see here get involved and uh, uh it, in fact the most common in fact in tb meningitis is uh, mca more towards the thalamo cortical or thalamo perforating branches towards the basal ganglia that is an explanation tb zone or bile ha huh. yes and uh, bilateral is less like bilateral symmetric is less likely but if you examine there would be one side more than the left side and one side more than the right than the other side and should we uh, give aspirin to this patient so if i am suspecting that uh, infarct is present should we give aspirin to this patient uh, ideally no uh, if an infarct 
test present, there would be a severe manifestation. In it. So we would present to a severe manifestation in the form of hemiparesis. Yes. A simple thermocortical branches or smaller branches, there is not much role. Aspirin is given to prevent such a recurrence. Yes. In this child, we know the cause. When we don't know the cause and we are working up for a stroke, yes. we tend to give antiplatelet drug like aspirin, which is also an anti-inflammatory. Yes. So while we work up for a stroke, we want to prevent further recurrence of the stroke, so we start aspirin. Since we know the reason for the stroke here, we have to hit the primary pathology, which we are already doing by giving steroids and ATT. Yes, sir. And in, uh, in so case of vascular pathology, sir, uh, should we give yeah. aspirin for whole two years or there is some interval that is required? Usually it is given for about uh, 18 months to two years. Yes, sir. In, in uh, focal cerebral arteriopathies because there are chances of recurrence in these children, so it is preferably given in large vessel vasculitis for about two years. 18 months to two years is what we 12 to 18 months, some people go up to 24 months also. 